my name's Abby. I'm an archives volunteer at Dr Jenner's Museum and will be studying medicine in September. Hi everyone, my name's Dr Emma Weinel and I'm a lecturer at Cardiff University and a science communicator. Hi, I'm Ian Stepick. I'm an organic chemist and I'm currently working as a researcher at the University of Nagoya in Japan studying new chemical reactions to make organic electronic materials. Hi everybody, my name is Neve Richmond and um, I'm a third year DPhil student here at the University of Oxford. I study immunology, um, specifically I look at memory B cells that reside in the lung tissue that produce the antibody against recurring infections. Hi, my name's Louise and I'm a postdoctoral research scientist working at the University of Oxford. When is it best to decide what area you want to specialise in and how did you come to this decision? Well, my first degree was in biochemistry and the reason I chose that was because at school I really liked biology and chemistry. Um, so for me, I wanted to mash them together and do a biochemistry degree. I really, really enjoyed that and I wanted to go on and do further study. So I applied for a PhD, so a higher degree. And once you complete that, you can call yourself a doctor. Uh, and I applied for lots of different PhDs in lots of different things. But the PhD that I chose um, to do was in Huntington's disease. So that's a brain condition. Um, which I find really interesting and I was working in the lab um, looking at Huntington's disease. So I kind of had a bit of a change really to go from biochemistry to neuroscience uh, and it's something that people often ask me about. It wasn't necessarily intentional but I just chose uh, subjects and topics that really interested me. And then I moved from the lab to the clinics, working with uh, people and families impacted by Huntington's disease. And now I do a lot more lecturing and teaching uh, and science communication work. So telling people uh, all the great things that there are to know about science. So in terms of specialising, I would say um, I've kind of chopped and changed. I've gone where... Um, or gone with what I really love and what I really like to do. So I didn't necessarily have a specialism in mind. Uh, I just decided to choose uh, different career options that really interested me and that I thought I would enjoy. I think that any researcher would tell you that your research interests evolve over time and that you never make a final decision about your specialization. But I think the first time that you have a good opportunity to make that decision is during your undergraduate or bachelor um, degree. Uh, at least that was the case for me. Uh, that was the first time that I had the opportunity to really work in a lab and do science with my own hands uh, in multiple different disciplines and understand what I enjoyed doing. And yeah, I, in my case, I found that I really enjoyed um, reacting chemicals together and making other chemicals and that made me feel like I was a real scientist and uh, for me that that pushed me on from there so yeah I would say that um, during your undergraduate is a good time to make an initial attempt at, at choosing your specialization. So I mean being in the field of medical sciences even that is already very broad um, so I think kind of in high school, I'm from Canada originally, so I did my high school and my undergraduate and my master's degree in Canada before coming to the UK. Um, so when I was younger, I always, I guess, kind of felt I had like an inclination towards biology. I didn't really know what that really meant. So I was, when I was really young, I wanted to be a vet. So I was considering vet school for a long time. And then kind of as I went through, I was like, well, you know, I really... As I went through my undergraduate studies, I really got into some of the technical stuff, um, genetics. I love genetics, uh, immunology too, but it actually wasn't my first choice, <laughs> to be honest. Um, that kind of came around a little bit later. When is best to decide what area to specialize in? I think that that can come towards the end of your undergraduate degree. So once you have a broad idea of the area that you're interested in, you can go into your undergrad, see if you like it. If you hate it, you can switch. Don't worry about it. Um, and then as you get a little bit later on in your degree, so your third or your fourth year, 
um, you can really kind of think about, well, the courses get more interesting. At least that was my, my experience, that my third and fourth year courses were a lot more interesting to me than my first and second year courses in undergrad. And then that gave me a lot more room to decide what area to specialize in. And then I knew that I really liked molecular biology. I liked things at a small level. I was interested in the mechanisms of biology. And, um, but I didn't really know how to apply that yet. So I ended up doing a master's in um, pathology and laboratory medicine so that I could kind of understand. I liked disease. It was weird, but I like to understand how we fluctuated through healthy and diseased state and, you know, what was responsible for that. I mean, what are the underlying mechanisms that are creating all of this change, you know? Because we can see it happen, but we don't know why, we don't know how. So, so I just thought that was kind of fascinating. So basically my master's taught me a lot about um, molecular biology and I did tons of studies on qPCR and um, differentiation of cells. So it was mainly a stem cell and tumor biology lab. And then towards the end of my master's, I took about a year and a half off actually before starting my PhD um, to work in basically biotech and I was just working for a company, uh, not nothing too interesting. Um, but it gave me time to think about what I actually really did want to specialize in. And that's when I decided, okay, I want to do my PhD. I'm really into it. And I want to keep going forward because I felt like I was kind of like at a standstill with where I could go. So I decided to pursue my studies and, and keep going um, just because, you know, I was curious. So then, um, then it came around to immunology, but the decision for immunology was a mix of factors. One, obviously, yes, I, I'm interested in it, but also when it comes to doing your PhD, the lab you choose um, and the people you work with are also really important. Um, so I met my supervisor, um, Tal Arnon, and I just thought she was such an incredible woman, so inspirational, so determined, so passionate. But that really rubbed off on me, and um, and I was just kind of like, you know what, let's just just have a good feeling about it. So let's go with that. It wasn't. Um, it was obviously the project was interesting to me as well. Of course, it had to be. But within that sort of niche of you know medical sciences, as in very early stage career, you know, I'm still a student. It was more about what I was going to learn from my PhD and what I could bring what I could take from that experience to bring forward. Because I think you'll notice as you move on, it's so important to challenge, to keep doing things that are going to sort of advance your skill set in one way or another, right? So as opposed to thinking, you know, I don't know if this is the right decision or not. Like, I don't know if this is the perfect position or the perfect job, because it's really hard to know that. I mean, it's almost impossible. But what you can do is you can think about, all right, well, will this experience, can I gain anything from this experience and what can I learn and will I, you know, what can I bring to the table? Because obviously you want to off, be able to offer a little something because it's always, you know, it's a mutual relationship. But then you also want to think about, am I going to add to my skill set here? Am I going to, um, yeah, is there more that I'm going to learn from this experience that will actually help me? to grow and to then be able to carry that forward as I, as I, as I move on. So that was the big thing for me. And this, and this position here at the Kennedy Institute at Oxford just had so many, there were so many amazing um, experts to work with that I just felt like I'm going to learn so much and I don't know if I'm cut out for it, but I'm going to try and just kind of embrace it and go with it. Um, and yeah. No regrets so far. <laughs> so with regards to when it's best to decide what to specialise in, um, I think it would depend on who you ask. So I'm a non-clinical scientist. So I did an undergraduate degree, a master's degree, and then a PhD. And for me personally, it wasn't until my PhD that I decided that I wanted to specialise in immunology. So I took my undergraduate degree, my master's degree, as an opportunity to um, learn more about different areas of biological sciences, which is what my degree was in. 
um, and really see what I enjoyed. And what I did enjoy was human biology and the biomedical side of um, the degree. So I decided to focus on immunology for my PhD. But I think it will change for everyone. I think some people will know very early what they want to specialise in and for some people it won't be until later, in, maybe in their degrees. Um, but I think ultimately if you focus on what you enjoy, I think that will help you to decide what to specialise in. What were the main challenges you faced when starting your career and how did you overcome them? So I think the main challenge um, that I would say I've faced is probably something um, called imposter syndrome. So it's really this feeling that many of us have in all sorts of different um, settings that we're maybe not good enough or we don't deserve to be there um, and we're a little bit out of our depth. So I absolutely had this feeling, um, particularly changing from biochemistry to neuroscience and particularly in um, academia. So the field of academia can be um, quite competitive as well. So really a turning point for me in terms of imposter syndrome and dealing with that came um, when I was sat listening to a talk that a, a colleague gave, uh, sat next to my PhD supervisor, who is a, a eminent professor, um, is retired now, but a really intelligent chap, huge number of publications, just an in incredible scientist. And at the end of the presentation, um, the, the presenter said, has anybody got any questions? And my PhD supervisor kind of turned to me subtly and, and kind of whispered, well, I've got a question, but I'm not sure about asking it because I'm worried that people might think I'm silly. And I was just completely taken aback by this because in my opinion, you know, everybody thought this chap was so intelligent and maybe that kind of fed the imposter syndrome a bit more. But actually it was recognition for me that everybody has this, everybody has this self-doubt and questions themselves. Um, so really talking about that and just discussing it with family and friends and colleagues is one of the ways that I have of overcoming those feelings um, and helping to progress and, and overcome them um, really. So that would be my main challenge I would say um, and how I overcame it. I think for me the main challenges that I've faced have largely come from my own head. I kind of uh, perhaps a degree of imposter syndrome when I've been around very smart people you kind of start to believe that you don't belong in that environment or kind of doubting yourself your ability to pick up new skills to become a more rounded uh, scientist that you should over time um, and I guess you overcome that just by being brave and by believing in yourself and trying new things uh, because more often than not, you will find that you were always up to that challenge in the first place. So I'm going to maybe say that starting with my career was entering graduate school. Let's go with that. It's the academic world. Um, some of the biggest challenges, number one, coming out of undergrad, the way you study, your schedule is totally up to you. So you need to become very um, good at doing your own self-assessment and keeping yourself on track. Um, so, you know, we in grad school, you don't really have um, weekly deadlines or anything like that. So in undergrad, I'm kind of used to coursework, right? So we had exams and then I knew that I had this midterm exam that was worth this much and your final exam is worth this much. And then you can kind of like really strategize and say, okay, I want to put you know, 10% of my effort into that one, but definitely 90% of my effort into the final exam, you know, so you can kind of do that. But in grad school, it's a different ball game. Um, it's more about the process. It's kind of like a marathon as opposed to a sprint. So um, you just want to be able to set your own goals. So it became really important to set my own schedule, be able to make sure that, um, I was kind of tracking the work that I was doing because you don't necessarily have the same sense of accomplishment if you're doing all these experiments and maybe, you know, you're not always getting positive results. Half, actually, most of the time you're getting negative results, but you're still, those are still just as valid and you're still just 
um, working really hard, right? So you need to, for me, it became really useful to kind of track my hours to make sure, you know, yeah, I am doing all of this work. It's just being assessed in a different way. Um, so that was one thing. Another thing um, was the balance between, again, kind of independent work and teamwork too. So depending on the environment that you're in, um, if you choose to do grad school, you may be um, sharing a project with someone or you may have your own project. Um, and I think one of the challenges was learning how to balance, you know, thinking about this in, in my own head and also communicating all of the science and, and what's going on um, either with my supervisor or with my colleagues and my lab mates. So that was new to me um, because before, you know, in undergrad, you, you all kind of have the exact same, you know, lecture notes and the same things to, to, to learn. So it's really easy to find that common ground um, to, to, you know, talk about and, and, you know, to understand each other. But in graduate school, it, it's more of an effort to kind of portray um, the same challenges. Um, for me personally, I think one thing that I struggled with um, quite early on, and still struggle with sometimes now, is the so-called imposter syndrome. So, and I know that a lot of other people struggle with this as well, and it's something that's quite difficult to overcome. It's the feeling that you don't belong in the job that you're doing, or that you're not quite clever enough to be um, doing this degree or this PhD, um, or that you're you're essentially an imposter and that you're going to get found out that you shouldn't actually be there when actually you have every right to be there you're qualified to be there it's just a lack of self-confidence and I know a lot of other people struggle with this as well particularly in science so that's something I struggled with and it's quite difficult to overcome but I think your confidence builds the more you study the longer you're doing the job and eventually you kind of learn that, oh no, I'm okay, I'm doing fine. I'm not an imposter. So that's something I've struggled with, and I know a lot of other people struggle with, and it's quite difficult to overcome. Did you find the nature of a science degree to be competitive? And if so, did it change your thoughts about the industry? So science uh, and science degrees are... Competitive, I would say. I would say there are lots of different places that offer science degrees. Um, and certainly at the moment, as part of my current job, I'm an admissions tutor. So I make decisions on people coming to university and whether we are able to offer them a place. Um, so I would say, yes, generally they are because they are strong, solid degrees to have. Um, certainly in terms of employment, employers really love STEM subjects uh, and the skills that you gain from having um, a STEM, so science, technology, engineering or maths, um, or a science degree. So I would say it was competitive, but only really from myself. So I um, am quite a competitive person. I'm quite academic as well. So I wanted to do well for me. Um, there were other people doing my degree that just kind of wanted to do the degree and get it done with and that that was fine too. Um, I would say as I've progressed kind of up the academic ladder it does get more competitive so certainly throughout my PhD and during the time that I was doing research that is incredibly competitive. Um, but I'm very much of the opinion that if you don't give it a try then you'll never know. So just because something's competitive doesn't necessarily mean that you shouldn't do it. You should just be aware that it is competitive, probably. Um, has it changed my thoughts about the industry? Perhaps. I certainly didn't realise when I went into research quite how competitive it is. And not only that, quite how often lots of things are just totally out of your control. So whether you'll be able to bring in the next big research grant often isn't something you can control and you can try really hard, you can put in the best application that you can, but sometimes it just doesn't work out. So realizing that yes, it's competitive, but the majority of the time there are things you can't control and as long as you do your best and try your hardest, that's absolutely all you can do. 
I think it very much depends where you pursue your degree um, and at what stage. In my undergraduate studies, I didn't find there was any competition. I thought there was a really nice sense of community in the university and our, our school year. I'm still friends with many of those guys now. That sense of competition did arrive a little during my doctorate. Um, I guess because it felt higher stakes. People felt like they, they had to look out for themselves more. And I think that can be the nature of academia sometimes. It didn't change my view on science because I think science is, is what is made of it by the people. It's not anything else. Um, but yeah, I think that the academic environment can sometimes foster that kind of atmosphere unintentionally, and that can be challenging for some people, for sure. Um, so I'll answer this in two parts. So um, I did my undergraduate degree. I did a bachelor's of science majoring in biology, specializing in animal physiology. Um, at that time, I didn't really find it so competitive. Um, I think, you know, my classes were really big. It was like 200, 300 people starting. Um, and then as I moved a little bit forward, you know, as you get to the upper years, then your class size goes, goes, goes down quite a bit. So my final year courses were maybe, you know, 40 people. But I think at that time, by the time we had the smaller class size, I actually was so so much more familiar with the system and there were many more friendly faces or familiar faces around anyway that I didn't really feel it was too competitive. Coming into my PhD at Oxford, I yeah, I was definitely way more intimidated by the level of competitiveness. Where I did my master's wasn't so competitive. Um, the school, the university wasn't as competitive, so naturally I didn't feel it was as competitive. Coming to Oxford, yeah, I was a little bit intimidated. Um, but I think at the same time, you do realize that, you know, you have this kind of cluster of very talented people together. And I think um, when individuals are care a lot, um, there's a need to kind of, you know, do it, do a good job. And and when everybody is so good at what you're doing, you may feel a little bit worse because you're like, I used to be really good at this and now I'm just kind of, you know, average or whatever. But that's the wrong way to look at it. The, the right way to look at it is to just, you know, really, again, just stay super open-hearted and open-minded and be like, wow, I'm, I'm just amazed, you know, and it keeps you really humble. One thing um, to handle competitiveness is just to, you know, recognize, you know what, I'm just, I'm happy for you. I'm, I'm happy for you. I really want you to do well. And I know that if I just, you know, focus on, you know, the little things that, that I can do and just try to enjoy my studies as opposed to worrying about the competition, then you're going to be so much happier. And the other biggest thing too is, is really try, try to ignore it a bit because it takes away from the relationships that you can have, right? So, um, the anti sort of antidote to competitiveness is, is you know, friendship and having um, positive relationships and, you know, trying your best. And, you know, sure, you're not always going to, you know, be happy-go-lucky, you know. But at the same time, if you can overall just realize that, you know, you're, you're in this together and you're working as a team and overall you just want the project to succeed for the bigger picture, you know, you can make it less about, like, my personal gain and more about I just you know want the research to be good so that we can all feel good and then I can feel good that that really helps um so no so originally yeah I felt it was competitive but I think it was just because I'd already decided in my head that it was competitive and then uh you know now I'm going into my third year and you know I think towards the end of my first year I just realized that you know we're all kind of the same and we're all just here to accomplish the same thing so it's just so much better to support each other um, than than to worry about it it just is much better you can enjoy your time and most people that's not just me most people feel are feel the same way right so there's always that camaraderie that you can have around the science and generally I didn't find it too competitive until I got to the PhD stage where um, 
it's not just applying for a position on a course, it's also applying for scholarships and funding to do the PhD. So then I started to notice it does get competitive. And certainly after the PhD as well, um, as you try and move up the academic chain, it's certainly very competitive. Um, it has changed my thoughts on the industry a little bit in that um, I've had to explore what other jobs I would like to do outside of academia and think really hard about where else a PhD could take me other than working and, and research in a university. But overall, I've really enjoyed the process and although it is competitive, you can still get a lot out of it and really enjoy it. What is the most rewarding thing you've done in your career? Wow, what a question. Um, so I, I'm going to pick a few um, because it's really hard to pick one. So I would say in terms of my current career, um, I do lots of teaching and lots of lecturing and something that I find incredibly rewarding is watching students um, come to Cardiff and they grow and they develop and they learn and to see them progress um, sometimes from quite shy, reserved young people when they come initially um, to Cardiff and they literally flourish into these incredible, um, talented young people that go on to such a huge array of careers and just being part of that and helping them along that journey is incredibly rewarding. The next thing I would say in terms of um, reward in my career, so it's probably from the time where I worked with patients and families impacted by Huntington's disease. So Huntington's disease is a really cruel, horrible um, genetic condition which affects the brain. And knowing that I was there to help them, uh, doing research which could potentially help um, people living with that disease and, and the family living with it as well was really rewarding um, and I found working with people who were impacted by Huntington's disease just incredibly rewarding and then finally I would say all of the work I do on science communication and public engagement is I love it it's just awesome um, teaching people about science, getting them to have a go, um, explaining what I do, what it's like to be a scientist, um, is all really rewarding, not only with kids and families, but all sorts of people. I mean, some of the best talks I've given are um, to octogenarians, so older people, um, getting them to have a go at DIY brain surgery, uh, demonstrating neurotransmission with bubble guns. So there are all sorts of innovative and creative and fun ways that you can go about science communication uh, and bringing it to new audiences. So that's what I really enjoy about that aspect of my career. Probably the most rewarding uh, project I've been involved in in my career so far was towards the end of my doctorate, where I was able to adapt my lab research into a workshop program for high school students. And I went around with some of my colleagues to local high schools in Zurich in Switzerland where I was living and uh, gave these kids not only an introduction to my work, but an introduction to organic chemistry and drug discovery in general. And hopefully was able to kind of inspire some of them and show them that um, this can be a really uh, rewarding and cool path to take. This is a tough question because there's lots of little rewarding things that you do along the way. But I think, you know, just very much a subjective choice for me personally. I really enjoyed my years when I was a TA. So I was um, teaching back where I did my master's. Um, and I really loved that. I found it was really fun. Particularly one of the course I was TAing um, was a fourth year um, animal models course so how to use animal modeling and research and I it was just really fun because they could I knew so much about it that I was really happy to share that with um, with you know students and also we had a lab and uh, it was kind of fun because I work with you know I've worked with mice and rats and pigs and all sorts of animals and I was a vet tech for a while too so cats horses dogs cows, you name it. Um, so 
being able to kind of familiarize maybe, you know, individuals who had never really handled a mouse before um, was actually really fun for me. So to teach them, you know, the best way to interact and the behavior and um, I, but it was less, it was maybe probably less about the material and more about just the being, yeah, being able to make somebody else comfortable was, was really rewarding for me. And I think you can find that in a lot of outreach that you do. So now sometimes with, uh, with my university here, we can, we go out sometimes across the country to the UK and um, with the TCAT program and we go visit, you know, young, element, young kids, we've seen elementary school and we just do these little activities um, for fun mostly that have to do with science. And I also find that really rewarding, being able to share the knowledge that you have with someone else um, and, you know, getting them excited about it always, always makes you feel better. For me personally, it was um, studying for a PhD and getting the PhD. That for me was a really big deal because it was something that I'd wanted to do for a long time since I was fairly young. And also, um, neither of my parents went to university, so I was the first generation to go to university. So to not only go to university, but to actually go to university and come out at the end with a PhD was a really big achievement for me and something that I'm really proud of. What is one thing not many people would know about your profession? So the one thing that not many people know about my profession. Well, for this, I'd really go back to being a scientist and doing research and not many people know that in order to be a scientist and do research you have to apply for money and funding to do the research and to pay your salary. So I was really lucky that I was able to apply for funding successfully um, through the Welsh Government through Health and Care Research Wales for a three-year fellowship which meant my salary was guaranteed for three years. But that's quite a fortunate position to be in. Lots of people are on shorter contracts than that, maybe a year or two years, sometimes less than that. And that means that they are constantly applying for the next source of income or funding. So from that perspective, research science can be a little bit unstable in terms of job security. Now, some people really um, embrace this and they get to travel the world and take on different jobs in different places um, and really get different experiences in the different places they go. For other people this can be quite frustrating and um, particularly in th terms of things like um, applying for mortgages or having a family and that can be quite a difficult thing to deal with and I think not many people know that's how research science is funded um, on what we call grants, so grant income where people have to apply for funding and it can be really quite unstable because of that. I guess one thing that people might not know about chemistry or think about is just how much of the things we depend on in everyday life are, are made by chemists like myself in a lab, you know, almost every medicine that has been developed is, has to be built atom by atom um, in the lab by chemists. Um, all kinds of plastics and materials and fabrics and everything, you know, everything is, everything is made of atoms and there's no such thing as a chemical free um, product. And so it's, I guess, people like myself who are responsible for putting all that stuff together. So yeah, we try and help. Um, I'm going to say two things actually, if I can. So the first one is that um, we may, you know, you may think of science and academic research as very um, methodical and, you know, boom, 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 very focused. But one thing I think people sometimes fail to recognize is the amount of creativity that you need um, as a scientist. It's enormous. Um, I think creativity, it, it gives you a lot of room to try different things. And even, even in the academic profession, um, scientific world of research, you still, you know, of course you, fo you follow a protocol to make sure that there's consistency across all of your experiments, that your results are valid. But at the same time, you do need some room to really think differently and outside of the box. And when something isn't obvious, 
then um, you're relying purely on your on your creative skills to to try to figure out what could be different. What am I not seeing? Um, the, you know, what else is going on? So that's one thing. Uh, the second thing um, is that <laughs> this is a bit silly. But one reason uh, academia is a great profession to go into is because you aren't stuck in a uniform all day. Um, so we wear lab coats, of course, in the lab, and we have all of our PPE. We need our goggles and our gloves and our lab coats. But underneath the lab coat, you can wear whatever you want, and no one will judge you for it, pretty much, um, within reason, maybe. But it's definitely not one of those careers where you have to, you know, wear high heels every day. Um, you know, you can just kind of roll out of bed and get yourself ready without worrying too much about your your appearance. And this may seem like a very superficial thing, but I actually think it does matter. And it just kind of goes to show that um, in this world, you know, people are just more so focused on, you know, your integrity um, as opposed to your appearance. And that's not always the case. One thing I think that people don't know about um, academic research, but also research in general, um, is how many opportunities you have to travel. So we attend a lot of conferences and a lot of the time these conferences are in places all over the world. And the nature of the work is such that you get the opportunity to attend at least one conference a year and um, usually there's funding to cover that as well so it's fully paid for so you get the opportunity to travel to some really cool places and um, so some of the places i've been lucky enough to travel to during my phd and in my current job include the united states um, israel germany um, the netherlands so you get to travel to some really cool places while still doing work and still learning about science, but you get to see um, a lot of cool new places. Mm -hmm.